Okay, so, hello. Um, so, today I'm going to give uh, two talks that are, maybe they have certain themes a little bit in common. Both will talk a little bit about temperature stable distributions, but basically they're two kind of separate talks um, on, on two somewhat different topics. The first one is mainly applications to uh, risk and, um, and finance. Uh, the second talk will discuss some applications to um, uh, biological uh, applications as well as some computer science applications. So, uh, the so, um, so this talk, well, um, maybe it's a kind of a long name. Uh, So now the talk has somewhat a long name, but the, the name is kind of a question, and the question is, does value at risk encourage or diversification when losses follow a uh, tempered stable or more general Levy process? So even, I think, without, um, I, I assume most of you are familiar with most of the terms here, maybe not, uh, not exactly tempered stable, but, um, but most of the terms I think everyone is familiar with, although I know there's some students here, so I will... Uh, who, or, and just generally some people who maybe don't remember all of, the, all of these technical terms, so I will talk about them quite a bit more. Uh, but, but anyway, this is the question, and I think even those of us who don't exactly know or remember what all of these terms mean could probably say roughly what the answer should be, and the answer should be, well, sometimes. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, and I'm going to try to um, give some conditions for when it does and when it doesn't. All right. So, so first, before I really get into trying to deal with this question, um, I want to just give a little bit of background about risk measures and and some of their properties. So first, uh, let L be the loss of some portfolio. So a portfolio is some collection of um, financial assets. Uh, we could think of them as a, a collection of stocks or bonds. Um, and L is the loss. So L is a random variable, which corresponds to right, at, uh, how much you will lose with this portfolio, say if you keep it for some fixed amount of time. So, positive, so when L is positive, that corresponds to something bad happening, you lose money. When L is negative, that's good. That means that um, we made a profit. So positive values of L are losses, negative values of L are gains. Now a risk measure is some way of trying to gauge how much risk there is in this portfolio. And we define a risk measure as just some function um, mapping the uh, collection of all possible losses in, in our market into the real line. Um, so the way we interpret a loss, uh, I'm sorry, a risk measure is if we have two losses, L1 and L2, corresponding to two different uh, potential portfolios, we interpret that if uh, the uh, risk function of L1 is less than that of L2, then somehow L1 is a, there's less risk involved in uh, the portfolio corresponding to L1 than the one that corresponds to L2. Now, this is a very general sort of intuition, right? And we'd like to get something a little bit more formal about what this function should really satisfy. And in a very important paper by Artzner et al. in 1999, they tried to set up some axiomatic approach about what a uh, good risk measure should really satisfy. And they came up with basically four important properties, and they said that if a risk, um, measure satisfies these four properties, then it's a, a, what they call a coherent risk uh, measure, and basically that means that it's uh, pretty reasonable. So the first condition is probably the most uh, intuitive. If L1, the loss for portfolio one, is always smaller than the loss in portfolio two, then uh, portfolio one should be less risky than portfolio two, so the risk of L1 should be less or equal to the risk of L2. Uh, L1 takes value 
they're they're both real valued. Um, yes. In a positive sense, in the usual sense. Oh. Um, Yes, yeah, so risk measure, right? So the risk measure maps the class of all possible losses into the real line. But the one. one takes where one. Uh, oh, uh, so L1 is just the loss, so losses are just random uh, uh, variables. Only one. Okay. Yeah. In a quality in the sense of an equality between random variables. Yes. Um, one less than L2. Uh, well, he, here it's the, um, the risk measure of L1 is less than the risk measure of L2. And so the risk, uh, although they could be, in, I guess, in principle of random, usually they're, they correspond <coughs> to the distribution, the underlying distribution. So they don't have to be random variables. Suppose we have yes. a shock and aftershock. The destruction both lost by combinations of these two would be bigger than destruction by them separately, because some bills will be partially destroyed by initial shock and then destroyed by the shock. So this will obviously will not be satisfied. Um, so somebody, somebody did it, yeah. uh, oh, okay. I haven't gotten to subadditivity. I'm just talking about the first one, monotonicity. Um, but does that answer your question? Or? Really not. I didn't. Get to the answer because what does it mean? L1 less than L2. Oh, 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 that right there. Yeah, these are random variables, so uh, almost surely. I, I'm sorry, I, sh I should have written almost surely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's um, monotonicity. Positive homogeneity basically just means that um, <coughs> if we have, um, I guess the simplest way to think of it is if lambda is. Um, is, is an integer, then if basically you buy lambda values of this portfolio, then the risk of um, lambda values of this port uh, portfolio, I'm sorry, the loss, uh, uh, that the risk of lambda values of this portfolio is the same thing as lambda times the risk of any one of these portfolios. Um, translation and variance, uh, and uh, well, just, um, just means that if we add a non random term then the, to the loss, then that should scale or shift the risk appropriately. And subadditivity in some ways, um, one, one of the most important ones, it says that the risk of having two, um, uh, of kind of diversifying and looking at two, portfol uh, two different portfolios should be less than uh, the loss of the sum of the, uh, I'm sorry, the sum of the risks of the two of them separately. So we think of this as talking about diversification because um, we're, we think that, okay, if we have L1 and L2, if we invest in uh, some of our money in L1, some in L2, then even though they both have some risk, but maybe only we'll lose some money with L1, but maybe we gain some with L2, and maybe those risks kind of, uh, that those things kind of cancel each other out. So we won't lose as much as if we just thought of investing into, in these kind of in isolation. So two different companies invested in, um, in them separately. Oh, I, I'm sorry. That's a typo. This should be L1. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, so that's uh, four standards. Um, may I ask you about the loss? For example, if you're uh, a trader, if you have options, mm -hmm. what would be your loss? The uh, payoff or minus the um, price of option? What would Basically, it's how much money you directly uh, you directly stand to to lose. Okay. So, um, right. So you can. Um, sorry, maybe I'll, I'll get back to that in just one second. Um, you, you mean this this what uh, what L1 means in the two L2? No, it's two случайных величин. И это просто almost sure. Да, я что-то One dimensional, да, одномерный. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, so now, if we talk about what we mean by the loss of a portfolio. Um, if you have options in your portfolio, uh, stock. Uh, uh, sure. So 
It's just for this portfolio, right, there's various possible, let, let's say you keep the portfolio for some fixed amount of time, and then at the end, you either have more money or less money than you initially, um, th than it was initially worth, right? So now it's worth something else. Taking into account whatever is in their options or, or whatever else, which, uh, you know, the options might, uh, might mitigate some of the risk uh, of, some of some of the other things, and that's kind of the idea that, that this subadditivity gets at, that having the options by themselves, they, they have some risk, Having the stocks by themselves, they have some risk. But if we take them together, that might mitigate some of the risk. And so if we have a portfolio that has a little bit of options and a little bit of stocks, then, um, then that, should be a little, that should be less risky than just having a portfolio with options and another one with stocks. OK. So a value at risk is one of the most commonly used measures of, um, of risk. Um, it's, uh, uh, well, its definition is here. Essentially, it's the quantile of the loss. So value at risk has a parameter gamma, which is some value between 0 and 1. We usually think of it as something large, like 0.95 or 0.99. Um, and so we can, if we look at this, basically what this is saying is that value at risk is the smallest amount such that the probability of losing more than this amount is really small, right? If we think of gamma as being small, then, uh, I'm sorry, if we think of gamma as being close to one. Там, наверное, не строгое неравенство. No, uh, no, we, we uh, strogo. In, in Agda, it uh, it, uh, sometimes it's written in terms of the CDF, and that, in that case, they have less or equal to. Uh, yeah, so I'm not assuming it's, uh, that Ikhim was attained. Okay, so, uh, so value at risk, right, we could think of it's the smallest amount such that the probability of losing more than it. Again, I, I'm talking a little bit, I'm talking informally now, so there's definitely questions about whether humans attain it and things of that nature. But informally, what this means is that value at risk is the smallest amount such that the probability of losing more than this is, uh, is small. And so we can kind of interpret this as saying that in some ways value at risk is the, more, the largest realistic loss. Losing more than this is very unlikely. We should be careful with saying things like that, of course, because uh, what does it mean that it's uh, unlikely, right? If we take gamma to be 0.95, well, 5% of the time we will lose more than value at risk. So we really can't say it, you know, that it's, it's bounded and we won't see anything more, but as an, kind of an intuition for how to interpret it, we could think of it that this is um, a largest amount we can lose uh, and losing more than this is very unlikely but of course possible and since it's possible if we uh, invest often enough it eventually it certainly has to happen but it's very close to the, to the notion of a quantile uh, it, it, not close it's exactly corresponds to the uh, quantile so f i didn't write the definition but f is the cdf of uh, the loss and so it's just the quantile of the loss at gamma no difference between quantile. No, no. This is exactly the quantile. Okay. What does this f mean? This. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, uh, so it's uh, of course quantile is the inverse function of the CDF, but the inverse doesn't have to exist. So uh, this is the generalized inverse in the in this sense of this infimum. Okay. So. Um, just, just, just for some comparison, uh, two, the two other most commonly used risk measures are standard deviation and expected shortfall. Of course, I think everyone here is uh, familiar with standard deviation. Um, uh, expected shortfall, the definition is maybe not very intuitive, but um, some kind of a average of all the possible value at risks larger than some value. But when the loss has a continuous distribution, it has a very nice and intuitive interpretation. An expected shortfall uh, sub gamma of a loss is just the expected value of the loss given that the loss is bigger than value at risk. Uh, oh, I, I, I apologize, yes. Uh, that's, that's gamma, thank you. But this is what's called average value. 
Uh, it's sometimes also called av average value at, at risk or sh uh, AV uh, AVAR for short. Um, this is also a standard framework to use a large dimension technique. If you have a systematic, you can compute rate function. And will you explore also this? Uh, so I'm not going to discuss uh, that. I'm going to focus on this question of diversification. But there's definitely many different ways to try to estimate this under various assumptions on the distribution. Um, so um, expected shortfall is, uh, as I said, basically the way we can think of it, we already think of VAR intuitively as the largest amount we can realistically lose. But if we wind up losing more than this amount, the expected amount that we lose is going to be exactly the expected shortfall. OK, and um, th these uh, measures of risk have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Of course, standard deviation has the advantage that it's well known. Everybody understands it very well. Uh, the, its disadvantages, well, it ex uh, assumes that the second moment exists, which, um, uh, which is, which, uh, is uh, questionable whether it does for financial returns. I, I argued in my first lecture that I think that it generally does, but, uh, but not everyone agrees with that. Um, on the other hand, and the other disadvantage is it's really difficult to interpret it for skewed distributions. For normal distributions, of course, standard deviation is, is very good and very easy to interpret. And generally, for symmetric ones, we have some, we can understand it. But if it's skewed, then if, if it's negative skewed, in, in fact, a larger standard deviation could actually mean less risk. So we need to be careful with, uh, with uh, standard deviation. Expected shortfall has some advantages. We, uh, it's, it's a coherent risk measure. It's, um, uh, it has this nice interpretation of being able to think of it as how much we expect to lose if we do wind up uh, losing more than value at risk. Um, as a disadvantage, it requires having a very good understanding of the tail of the distrib distribution. And it requires a finite first moment Although I think that's much less controversial and pretty much I think everyone agrees that uh, returns have a finite uh, first moment. So, or, or that losses would have a finite uh, first moment. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, I just want to say a little bit about these two, although I will not uh, focus on them in this talk. Um, of course, value at risk also has its advantages and disadvantages. And um, one of its advantages is I think it's relatively easy to interpret. Um, it's, as a disadvantage, of course, we still need to know a lot about the tail of the distribution, which, we, which is hard to get a hold on, uh, to really understand very well. Um, although not as much knowledge of the, dis of the tail as we need for uh, expected shortfall. And the other big disadvantage, it's not a coherent risk measure. And it does not, um, in particular, the reason it's not coherent is that it does not satisfy uh, the axiom of subadditivity. So in a sense, it's... Um, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily. It doesn't always encourage diversification, um, although it does satisfy the other three axioms. But this very important one of subadditivity is not satisfied by uh, value yeah. at risk. Excuse me. Yes. But is it correct that uh, gamma is fixed? And yes. It is, uh, in practice, uh, it is given by some Basel conventions and stuff like this. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. yeah um, yeah, so the parameter, yeah, here, the parameter gamma, it, we, we, so this is, you can think of this as a family of risk measures, one for any gamma. Of course, uh, if gamma is not relatively large, it's not very, uh, very interesting. And, uh, uh, and exactly this, this uh, one of the main reasons to study value at risk, despite the fact that it's not coherent and has uh, other disadvantages, is that nevertheless, uh, it's, it's um, uh, banks are required by their regulators to measure their risk in terms of uh, value at risk. So they have to use it. So whether whether it's uh, regardless of its advantages or disadvantages, uh, it, it, this is what banks actually have to use to measure their risk. Okay. So just uh, to get this uh, to this idea um, uh, that. VAR is not, uh, or, uh, VAR of course short for value at risk is, is not um, coherent. Uh, let's consider a simple example. This is due to McNeil et al. from, uh, from their 2005 book. Um, so let's say we have uh, 100 defaultable corporate bonds. Uh, each one costs $100 and 
at the end of some fixed time period, we'll get $105 back if everything, if uh, they don't default. Uh, let's assume that, that whether they default or not is, uh, is independent and the probability of any one of them defaulting is uh, 0 0.02, so 2%. So we can calculate um, the loss uh, in this case um, for any one, uh, so if you buy just one bond, the loss will be, well, 100, uh, we, we, uh, we lose the $100 we invest. So we lose 100, but because it's the loss, it's positive. So we lose $100 with probability two, uh, 0 0.02, and we gain $5 uh, with uh, probability 0.98. So, uh, so that's negative, since it's a gain, it's uh, minus five. Okay. So now let's, uh, let's consider two uh, portfolios. One I already mentioned is uh, we buy one from each company. And another uh, portfolio is we buy just 100 uh, bonds from portfolio, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for, from company one. Now the loss for portfolio A, the one where we just buy everything from company one, of course is just going to be 100 times the loss of, uh, from, uh, due to company one. <coughs> The loss for portfolio B is the sum of the losses for all of these, um, uh, for, for, for each one of these 100 um, companies. Okay, so the question uh, is which of these portfolios is riskier? Yeah, what's, what's a good ask? Each of both portfolio defaults, which defaults quicker? I'm sorry? Okay, the, the, uh, the question from last division will be, if you assume that both portfolio defaults, which uh, will default uh, uh, quicker? Um, will be quite a sort of computation also. Uh, right, that, that could be an interesting question. In, in this very, very simplified example, just to get uh, to this idea, I'm assuming that uh, default is only within, the, uh, within um, a, a particular, uh, I guess still it's, it's a relevant question. Um, uh, if you're thinking of, dynamically modifying this portfolio in time, then certainly that would be something that you'd want to think about. In this case, I'm thinking of this just as a static portfolio, which we... Case, two linear curves with different rates, this is very simple. Right. Okay, so which portfolio is riskier? Well, um, without getting into anything too complicated in thinking about this, with portfolio A, the probability of losing everything, that all $10,000 that the portfolio costs, is uh, 0.02. With portfolio B, it's, well, it's approximately zero. Uh, on the other hand, with, in portfolio A, the probability of gaining 500, the maximum we can gain, is 0.98. While with portfolio B, the probability of gaining um, all $500 we stand to gain is, uh, well, about uh, 0.13. So from the, if we are interested in, if we, are, if we don't care about risk and we just want to maximize our profit, uh, maybe portfolio A is better. I, I'm not going to make any argument about which is better. Uh, that depends on our preferences. But if we're talking about measuring risk, um, I think we could say that portfolio A seems like it should be the riskier portfolio. Uh, at least, uh, you know, these are just some uh, two very simple ways of looking at it. But um, in this sense, it suggests that we, uh, portfolio A is riskier. Now, whether we want to invest in A or B, again, that's, uh, that's a separate question. But when we measure risk, we probably want portfolio A to be the riskier portfolio. However, in terms of value at risk, what happens with portfolio A? Well, uh, the value at risk, let's say at the level of gamma equals 2.95, is going to be... Um, well, it's, it's a var of 100 L1, right? Because just based on company one, we can pull out the 100 by uh, positive um, homogeneity, and we're left with 100 times the value at risk of L1. But L1, right, but this is value at risk based on um, gamma equals 2.95. Well, with, uh, with that probability, we're, we don't stand to lose anything because the probability of losing something from company one is 0.02. So actually, we, uh, according to value at risk, 
this is a com there is no risk in this portfolio. And actually, value at risk tells us that, well, the value at risk is um, minus 500, which roughly me speaking means that once you've uh, purchased these stocks, uh, I'm sorry, these bonds, we have, uh, we, we have $500, we can already start spending them, right? We don't need to worry about uh, mitigating any risk because uh, VAR tells us there is no risk, which of course we, we saw is, is not really true. It's just the probability of a risk is relatively, uh, the probability of, a, of losing, uh, of a, the probability of losing something is small, Again, not really that small, but small relative to uh, one minus gamma. Uh, the interesting question in this direction. Suppose you have a crash in the market. So, so you see there is so some crisis. And your aim is to survive as long as you possibly could. Which, which portfolio you should switch, to, uh, not to gain the maximum money, but to, to survive the, the, the crash? Uh, if you see the crash, well, not definitely will develop, it's, I mean, for, for this simple model, uh, I don't think it would be very difficult. Um, okay. Um, so, so for portfolio A, we're told basically there's no risk from, uh, uh, whereas for portfolio B, well, it corresponds to the sum of. Uh, of the losses from each one of those um, companies. And if we do kind of a, a simple analysis, we could see that the probability of getting more than four defaults is uh, 0.051, which is still a little bit bigger than 0.05. So, um, uh, so, so, that one, so, that's, um, uh, so that one doesn't count. So four is still okay, but uh, uh, but the probability of being of more than five, five or more defaults is already less than 0.05. As the first time, it's less than 0.05. So, uh, so basically, that will be uh, what, uh, uh, what what VAR assumes is the level at which um, you know th th that's basically our maximum risk. Uh, and so, if we uh, so if we do have five defaults, then the amount that we lose will be exactly 100 times uh, right dollars that we pay for these five um, uh, bonds um, minus five times the five dollars we get back from each of the 95 uh, bonds that didn't default and we wind up with a risk of $25. And so at least based on value at risk, to mitigate the risk of uh, portfolio B, we need to make sure we have $25 uh, somehow you know, in, in some other assets that we are confident will not default. Uh, whereas, in, whereas for portfolio A, we, we're so confident in it that we'd like to just take the $500, uh, $500 we could already start spending it. And yet, as we saw in the previous uh, slide, that's probably not quite um, a good idea uh, because there is still risk in portfolio A. Um, and portfolio B, of course, still has risk, but, uh, but maybe a bit less. Okay, so, um, so that tells us that value at risk does not necessarily, kind of illustrates for us that value at risk does not necessarily, um, um, or um, maybe I should add one more point before I say this. Of course, the difference between these portfolios is in portfolio A, we put everything kind of in one basket, whereas in portfolio B, we diversify our portfolio. And so, um, this kind of shows us that value at risk does not necessarily encourage diversification and in fact may discourage it, right? If you say, well, let's go with portfolio A, there's so much less risk, well, uh, well we've gone with a less diversified portfolio. And it's not difficult to show that this corresponds to exactly um, a violation of the sub-additivity uh, axiom that we discussed uh, a few slides earlier. Okay, so in general, value at risk is not coherent, does not, uh, satisfy the subadditivity axiom and does not uh, encourage diversification. However, it is coherent in s uh, several important situations. <coughs> One is when all of the losses are normal or Gaussian. Another is when the losses have uh, regularly varying tails uh, with a tail index greater than one, which means they have a finite uh, mean. Um, 
But, but this, um, uh, but the condition is that gamma approaches one. So we're not really guaranteed for any fixed gamma that it will encourage diversification, just that in general, uh, when gamma, for, for large enough gamma, it will hold. So it's kind of an asymptotic result. And the third case is symmetric alpha stable, uh, in the case where the losses are independent, symmetric alpha stable uh, distributions with alpha greater than or, or, or between uh, one and two. Um, and this was proved in a um, paper of Ibrahim of 2009. What is specifically about the, uh, the range between zero, zero, zero and one? It's, it's not true, the statement. Or it's uh, technically it's difficult to prove. Well, what, what you believe is. Oh, I, I actually want to go through the, uh, the argument, uh, uh, Ibrahim's argument, uh, in the next few slides, so that will illustrate what happens. Um, but I will do it in the context of so Ibrahimov actually introduced a more general way of talking about uh, diversification, uh, which um, um, theory. based on majorization theory. So, um, so I want to uh, briefly discuss this approach, and then we'll talk about uh, how, how he showed it for stable distributions, and then maybe how we can extend it to other types of distributions. So, uh, so Ibrahim of 2009 considered this uh, a more general way of doing th of talking about diversification, and it's in um, in majorization theory. There's a way of talking about if you have two vectors, you could talk about which is a more diversified vector, um, in, in a certain sense, specifically. So let u and v be two vectors, and I will, I will always uh, we will think of these as the weights of our portfolios, and I will assume that they're. Um, n-dimensional vectors in, uh, and always greater than, all the components are greater than or equal to zero. Now, of course, the components could be in any order, so I'd like to order the components of these two vectors. So let u1 be the largest uh, component of, of uh, vector u, u2 the next largest, and so forth until un is the smallest component. So we've just ordered the elements of u from one largest to n smallest. And we can do the same thing for vector v. Now we write that um, u is majorized by v if uh, these two statements hold. So what's happening here, let me, uh, let me go to this one first, is just that when we add them up, we wind up with, um, with the same numbers. So if we think about this uh, in terms of uh, weights for a portfolio, right, so we have uh, n assets, and we want to figure out how much we should invest into each one of the assets. Um, these, are, these are the weights, and it, it doesn't make sense to try to compare portfolios where you know, we spend very different uh, amounts of money, right? one based on $1,000, one based on $100. So this just means that the amount we invest in every single one of the assets, or the amount we have for the total portfolio, is, is the same. Uh, whether we go with a uh, portfolio given by the weights in U, or the portfolio given by the weights in V. So when we add up all the components, they should equal each other. Um, and when, but when we look at just the sum of the first, well, let's, let's first just take K equal to one. We're just saying that the largest uh, component for U is, uh, is smaller than the largest component for V. Or, or more generally, the, largest, uh, the sum of the largest K components of U is smaller than the uh, uh, largest K components of uh, v. Um, and I, I, I will this, uh, and we think of this as that u is more diversified than v. That's maybe not clear from uh, from here, but I'll I'll give some. Also, G index in economics might be common about this. The kind of argument. Simpson uh, index, yes, um, th that also satisfy. Uh, um, uh, Stressed by something similar, and actually, I'll talk a little bit about that in my, um, I think, my lecture next week on Friday. Um, but, um, uh, but yes. So, so this is a definition, and I will try to motivate why this is a reasonable definition for saying that U is more diversified than um, than V. So, well, first of all, um, we. we it's easy to show that we get these um, inequalities. So basically, if we, I, I think intuitively, right, if we invest equal amounts into every single um, a asset, that's 
about as diversified as we can get. And then if we kind of keep excluding, okay, still equal in everything except we don't include one of the assets, well, that's a little bit less diversified until we go all the way to, let's just put all our money into one asset. So we have these kind of inequalities uh, or this kind of um, fact, which maybe gives some idea of why um, if u is majorized by v, then u is a little more diversified than v. Of course, some ideas, because till the end it's not very clear. Because, uh, because 1 over n everywhere is less diversified than 0 everywhere and 1. Sure, uh, and I will give one more motivation. Um, so let's, let's consider uh, some vector v. And uh, from its largest element, let's subtract just a tiny little bit and add it to its smallest element. And I think intuitively this, it's a minor change, but intuitively this gets, uh, right, we're, we're kind of saying, okay, but this should make this more uh, diversified. And um, let's do it in such a way that the order of the elements doesn't change. So it's just a very small amount uh, that we just take from the larger, largest uh, value to the uh, smallest one. And the new vector let's denote by u. And it's not difficult to see that u will be majorized by v, the original vector, right? Just comes from this definition. Now its largest element will be smaller than the largest element of v. And basically the rest of the elements except for the smallest aren't going to be changed. And so the inequality will, will, will stay this way until, until the end where it's equal. Um, and we, we could do this not just with the largest and smallest, but basically with, with any one that's a little bit larger and any one that's a little bit smaller. So maybe that gives a little bit more intuition as to why this might be a reasonable way of thinking. Uh, yes? Why are not considering entropy? I'm sorry? Why are not considering entropy? So um, if you are speaking about discrete probability distributions, it's not um, natural. Sure, uh, and entropy is a particular way to measure a diver um, how, how diverse uh, something is. It's so, um, I, I, I can, um, so I will actually talk more about entropy in, uh, along with the Gini Simpson index in, uh, in, my fri in next Friday's uh, talk. But, um, but I mean, that's a way of measuring. So if, you actually, if you're given a vector and you want to just measure how, um, how, how, the, how diversified it is, that's one way to do it. Gini Simpson's another way to do it. Um, and in general, uh, one way, what we could do is, so, um, well, we define a general class of functions. So let f map these kind of vectors into the real line. Um, if f is always, if f of u is always less or equal to f of v when u is uh, majorized by v, we say that f is sure convex. On the other hand, if f of u is always greater than or equal to f of v when u is majorized by v, we say that f is sure uh, concave. Um, and, um, and so if we think about this, so actually what, what we can show is that both um, Gini Simpson and entropy um, satisfy the second condition, they're sure concave. And so whenever, uh, so if the entropy of one um, vector is uh, bigger than that of the other vector, that means that, uh, so if, if entropy of u is bigger than, um, let me make sure I'm, yeah, if entropy of u is bigger than entropy of v, uh, okay, I should say it the other way. If, if u is majorized by v, then the entropy of u will always be bigger than the entropy of v. Um, so, so the, the, the inverse is not general rule. Uh, the, no, um, well, of, of course, if, if for no other reason than because, uh, well, okay, for, for probability distributions, this will hold. Uh, I, um, no, because um, you, you can find vectors which don't satisfy anything of, of this sort. They don't satisfy this. They don't satisfy it with a different you know, with the reverse inequality. So they're not comparable in the sense of majorization. Okay, um, so, so for us, if we could think of it that for a risk measure, we might want, to, want the risk measure to be sure convex. 
right? Because that would mean that if u is majorized by v, that means u in some ways is more diversified uh, than v, so its risk should be smaller. So if we think of f as a risk measure, then we would exactly want this first condition to hold, and so we'd want it to be sure convex. Um, yeah, in, in ecological applications, sometimes uh, sure concavity is called the evenness property, um, which, uh, which, uh, which again is related to some things I will talk about uh, next week. Okay. Um, so, um, so basically this is what I said. Let's consider that we have x1, x2 up to xn are random variables representing the, some different risk factors. So kind of each one of them is the loss of their corresponding um, uh, asset. And W is a vector of weights for a portfolio. I will use this uh, notation X sub W to correspond to the loss of the portfolio, which is just a linear combination of, uh, of these losses with weights uh, being the W's. And uh, following Ibrahim of 2009, we'll say that a risk measure rho uh, encourages diversification if uh, rho of x u when the weights come from vector u is less or equal to rho of x uh, v whenever u is uh, majorized by v. In other words, when uh, the risk measure is uh, sure convex. Okay. Um, so one thing to note, this property is stronger than subadditivity. So assuming that a risk measure is sure convex, Will, uh, will imply, uh, in the presence of positive homogeneity, one of, uh, right, the, uh, one of the other three axioms for a coherent risk measure, in the presence of positive homogeneity, uh, um, if, if a risk uh, measure is sure convex, then it has to be uh, subadditive. So for instance, um, or not for instance, but how we can show this is, um, so let, be, uh, let rho be just some sure convex risk measure that satisfies positive homogeneity. Well, we can consider, okay, 0.5 times the risk of x plus y. By positive homogeneity, we can bring uh, the 0.5 inside the risk measure. And then by uh, sure convexity, we can upper bound this by just, uh, by just x. Or equivalently, we could upper bound it by just y, and so adding the two uh, equations together gives us exactly the formula for um, subadditivity. So, um, so, sure, so if uh, um, a, sure, a risk measure that's sure convex and, uh, po and satisfies positive homogeneity necessarily uh, satisfies subadditivity. But it's a stronger condition. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about uh, the case of stable distributions and why, when we have stable, di uh, when um, when when we have stable distributions, we'll will satisfy this uh, this assumption. So just very briefly to remind everyone of stable uh, distributions. Uh, distribution is stable basically if it's stable. Uh, okay, I think I wrote this um, for R D, but um, in, this is uh, true just for R one and for our purposes here, we just need it for R one. So if x1 uh, plus x, x2 uh, up to xn are iid random variables, if, the distribu if x1 up to xn, if we add them together, up to some shifting and scaling, if they're equal in distribution to x1, we say that they're stable. Um, and necessarily, it can be shown that the scaling an has to be n to the minus 1 over alpha for some alpha between um, 0 and 2. Can't equal 0, but it can equal Two, and if it equals two, this corresponds exactly to normal distributions. If we can take Bn to be, ident uh, to be identically zero, we say that these distributions are strictly stable. And one important uh, fact is that all stable distributions which are symmetric around zero are uh, strictly stable. Um, now, for strictly stable distributions, we get... Um, uh, we get this slightly stronger uh, condition that if we take um, x1, x2 up to xn to be iid strictly stable random uh, variables, 
then this linear combination, right, let's say with some, um, some weights um, coming from this weight vector v, we take the linear combination for the portfolio, it turns out that this is equal in distribution to x1 times some function, um, I, I, I apologize, there's a typo, that should be f alpha of, v of x, but f alpha of v, where f alpha of v is exactly uh, this term here. May I ask yes. you to just come back to the previous slide? Sure. Just a second. Okay, so this is the definition of stable? Uh, this is the definition of stable, uh, and for strictly stable, bn should be zero. Right. So the difference is here, right, if we think of this in terms of our weights, well, all of the weights are just an everywhere. But here we're allowing for any kind of weights, um, um, they don't. Uh, they, they don't have to. Well, I, I, here I'm assuming that they're non-negative. They, they could be negative, but then we need to, uh, you know, interpret the uh, negative sign appropriately. Um, so, but 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 for uh, for portfolios, I'm going to stick to the case where our portfolio weights are always positive. In principle, they could be negative if we want to short something, but I'm not considering that uh, here. Okay, so, so this is now, uh, this, this is our portfolio, and it turns out that this portfolio uh, is equal in distribution just to this f alpha of v times x1. So all v equals 1, you have just m minus 1 alpha, and you have it, uh, just to uh, if v, it's a generalization. Yes, exactly. If, if v equals, uh, if uh, v equal, if all of the v's are 1, then we would exactly have here n uh, to the... From uh, the right hand side, and from the left hand side you have n minus. Yes. So it's okay. Okay, yes. Um, and, and so um, an interesting fact about this function, and um, I think I have a slide a little bit later which will, will give us some justification for why this is true, but this function actually for alpha between 1 and 2 is sure convex. And alpha between 0 and 1 is sure convex. Uh, I, I apologize, it should not be an E here, um, sure concave. So, um, interestingly, the case when alpha equals 1, both sure convex and sure concave, and, well, that's basically because we're, right, the, we, we can forget about the alpha, it's just the sum of the VIs. So, this is the, 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 the statement, it is not correct, for your all method is not working. The statement is false, and, and in fact, we get a we get the reverse statement. Um, it, 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 in a sense, always discourages diversification. Yes, yes. yes because of this uh, sure uh, sure concavi uh, concavity in the case when alpha is between zero and two. Uh, I'm sorry, zero and one. So yeah, so it's not just that we can't answer that question or we don't know how to. For stable distributions, it's, the reverse will be true, yes. Um, so uh, what can we say? So let me just quickly uh, justify the statement for alpha between one and two. Um, and let's assume that gamma is between 0.5 and one, which if, if it's less than that, it's not maybe very interesting anyway because that means that we're setting a threshold way too, too low, right? We want it to be much bigger, more like 0.95 or 0.99. Okay, so let's consider the value at risk of our portfolio. Um, and let's assume uh, vector u is majorized by vector v. So we have now, um, right, so value at risk of the portfolio based on uh, vector v. Uh, did, I, um, did I want this the other way around? The bigger one is u, so, no, I'm sorry, once, right, the more diversified one, which should have the smaller value at risk, so we want um, uh, v majorized by u. I apologize. Okay, so the value at risk of this port, uh, portfolio with weights uh, v um, equals um, by by this fact here equals just um, 
f alpha of v times x1. By positive homogeneity, we can just pull out the f alpha of v. Um, and then, because we know f alpha of v is sure convex, uh, we can upper bound by f alpha of u, right, because u is uh, the majorizing vector. Then, of course, we could bring it back into, uh, into value at risk by positive homogeneity. And, well, now by, again, using um, this fact, we get that this is the value at risk of, portfolio of x with portfolio, uh, with uh, vectors u. And for alpha equals 1, you have both convex and uh, uh, concave, yes. so you have a linear uh, in fact. Yes, in that case, it's equal, exactly. Mm -hmm. It is not a coherent measure in general, but for uh, stable distributions uh, that are uh, symmetric stable distributions. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I. Um, so, on the second on, on the third slide, we told us that this is the main advantage of this measure. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, expected shortfall ah. is coherent. Uh, value at risk is not. The whole point of, of this talk is to say that although it isn't, there are many situations when it is coherent. And stable distributions is one of them. Um, let me see, I, um, yeah, I, I actually, I, th th there's one, uh, one issue here. I, I needed to say that we're assuming that x1 is symmetric. Uh, and I'll get to why uh, we need that assumption in a moment. Uh, but by a similar argument to what we just did, uh, we could say that we can show that when alpha is between 0 and 1, value at risk um, of the portfolio based on weights, uh, weight vector v is greater than or equal to the value at risk for uh, weight vector u. So this is exactly the reverse inequality. And of course, interestingly, at alpha equals 1, that we get equality. Okay, I, I'm happy to answer, you know, uh, questions if there are any. Um, okay, so, so basically this means that value at risk encourages diversification when alpha is between 1 and 2 and does exactly the opposite, discourages it when alpha is between 0 and 1. Again, this is for symmetric uh, distrib uh, stable distributions, uh, which as we saw, uh, they're, all, they're necessarily strictly stable. Now, why do, we, do I make this assumption of symmetry? Well, basically because if they're symmetric, that means that value at risk of x will always be positive for gamma between 0.5 and, and 1. Otherwise, it could be negative, and so uh, these inequalities, right, if we wind up with, uh, with something negative, of course, we, uh, right, if the value at risk itself is, uh, um, right, oh, like oh, over there where we're multiplying it by f alpha of v, if value at risk itself is negative, of course, the inequality would have to change. So, we, so since value at risk could be negative, we need to make sure that value at risk is not negative um, in the situations we're considering here. And for that reason, we need to make sure that um, gamma is between 0.5 and 1. Symmetry is sufficient um, for, for any gamma between 0.5 and 1. For if we have, we still need strictly stable because um, because all of these arguments are based on a strict stability, uh, but we don't necessarily need symmetry so long as gamma is between 1 and the probability that x is negative. So now for symmetric distributions, probability x is negative is exactly 1 half, so that's where gamma between 1 and 1 half comes from. Obviously, the mathematical answer is not known, but what is the intuition? If you have a, cr a crash, and the goal is to survive for as long as possible, and alpha is between 0 and 1, or between uh, 1 and 2. What, what would the answer? Did I survive or not? For both regions? Um, I mean, intuitively. Well, I, I guess one thing to keep in mind is that this is a r risk measure, and so maybe one question to ask is, should we use value at risk at all? And if we do, um, what, 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 how, how we should use it. So, um, so if, if we believe that the distribution ha is with alpha between uh, 0 and 1, uh, 
uh, which, which would mean we have an infinite, ver uh, infinite mean and very heavy tails. Um, I, I would say perhaps we should be very careful with value at risk and, and maybe use some other uh, risk measure. Risk function, of course. Yeah. Rate function should be used in this case. Which one we should use? Rate function for, for, for stable process. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Is there a okay. But well, it's separate. Okay. We, we, we can talk about that, um, that more uh, afterwards. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so we, we could generalize this to the skewed case, but we just need to be careful about um, um, uh, about gamma because we might wind up with negative value at risk, so things uh, change now, uh, in that case. Okay, um, and um, in Ibergimov's paper, he made some additional generalizations to certain dependent cases and certain cases where things aren't IID. Uh, I'm not going to uh, get into here. Uh, some of the results are a little bit more um, subtle, uh, but I'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, my work in this, which is if we remove the assumption of stability and just assume that our distributions are infinitely divisible. So I, I talked uh, quite a bit about infinite divisibility in my previous lectures, and, uh, and also I assume most of you um, are quite familiar with it, but just very briefly, so we're all on the same page, let me just briefly go through what do we mean by a infinitely divisible distribution. Well, it's one that's, um, so x is said to be infinitely divisible if for any n, uh, if we can take uh, some distribution mu sub n, such that if we take y1 up to yn, iid from this distribution, x is equal in distribution to the sum of y1 up to yn. So, um, so, so in this sense, we can divide it, right, for, for any n, we can kind of divide it into a sum of n iid random variables. And one of the most useful uh, facts about infinitely divisible distributions is that their characteristic functions can be written in this form, which is sometimes called the levy hinchin representation, in terms of um, a Gaussian uh, variance A, a shift vector, or I'm sorry, a shift uh, uh, constant B, and uh, a measure M, uh, which is a Borel measure satisfying um, uh, this uh, inequality. So it has to kind of, uh, be finite when we're away from zero and integrate x squared near zero, and at zero it's just uh, doesn't have any mass. And then the parameters A, M, and B uniquely determine the distribution, and I'll summarize this distribution by writing mu is infinitely divisible with parameters a, m, and b. Okay, and uh, I will mainly focus on two classes of infinitely divisible distributions. One is class uh, which I call S, which is S for symmetry, so symmetric uh, infinitely divisible distributions. Um, uh, for simplicity, I assume that there's no uh, Gaussian part. Um, actually, the results basically remain uh, even if it's there, but uh, at least most of the results. But um, for simplicity, I'm not going to consider that here. Um, and, uh, and also for simplicity, I'll assume that we do not have a shift. Uh, and that M is, uh, and so being symmetric in this case basically just means that M is a symmetric measure. And P will be the class of all uh, positive um, infinitely divisible um, distributions. That is that their support is from zero to positive infinity. And for that to hold, we need that it can't place any mass on any of the negative numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Levy measure cannot play, place mass on any of the negative numbers. But that's not quite enough for uh, the support of the actual distribution to be on the positive numbers. We also need to make sure that the um, integral from 0 to 1 of x, m of dx is finite, and uh, we will set our, um, our shift b to be exactly uh, this value. OK. So now um, let's assume we have um, a portfolio where all of the risk factors are iid infinitely divisible distributions. And we have some, uh, some weights, uh, W1 through Wn. Again, I'm assuming that they're all uh, non-negative numbers. And 
then our portfolio, just as we've been talking about for stable distributions, x sub w is just the linear combination of the xi's with weights w. Um, in this case, we can show that the Levy measure of the portfolio can be written as this kind of um, uh, as so we're again we're assuming that the x's are all iid with Levy measure m, and so. Uh, basically, we need to take some kind of linear combination of, um, of the, uh, so for of the Levy measures, weight kind of weighted uh, appropriately of each of the x's, and that's going to be the Levy measure of the portfolio. But the portfolio itself necessarily has to also be infinitely divisible. So with uh, with this Levy measure, okay, and then we can get um, get a result that. Um, which in this form I think looks kind of complicated, but we can then simplify it and, and get something that I think is actually useful or usable. Um, so uh, let uh, mu be infinitely divisible with Levy measure m and assume it be belongs to one of, um, uh, one of the two um, classes we described, uh, class S or class uh, P. And uh, I guess uh, my notation here is not very good because, of course, for class P, we actually need, um, need a shift to not be zero, but to be something that I uh, specified earlier. Um, but uh, but, we, uh, but uh, basically, we just need mu to be in class S or P. If uh, mu is in class P, fix gamma, uh, in class S, fix gamma between 0.5 and 1. And if it's in class uh, P, fix gamma, just be anything between 0 and 1. And define this uh, g of w, which is basically just the tail of this uh, Levy measure um, for the portfolio. So if we basically, if we just want to look at its tail, it will exactly correspond to this uh, function gr of w. So if gr is sure convex, then basically value at risk. Is a uh, is also a sure convex uh, function, and if it, if gr is sure concave, then value at risk will also be sure concave for um, its infinitely divisible distributions. Um, and further, um, we, we we don't get we can't uh, so parts one and two are not necessary and sufficient in general. At least uh, at least I can't show that. But if we have the stronger assumption that uh, M integrates X uh, near zero, uh, which corresponds to the case of finite variation of sort of the associated Levy process. In that case, uh, we actually get the converse of parts one and two to hold. Uh, we please repeat this uh, two whole set of measures. I don't know how to pronounce them. Um, please, oh, this, this, uh, 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 oh, okay, yeah, this is a. A a S and P. Yes. S corresponds to symmetric infinitely divisible distributions, yes. and P corresponds to positive ones. That is, ones concentrated on zero to infinity, they're, they're, whose support is is. Uh, okay. Uh, and what is your motivation to consider such, such sums? Um, um, the definition of GR. So what is the okay. motivation of considering? The, Sure. The intuition comes from if we look at the Levy measure of the portfolio, it's going to be uh, given this way, and so if we look at the tail of this measure, um, the tail of this measure kind of um, it was divided by the, yes, right? the definition of the G. Yes, it was divided. It looks like condition. But oh, I, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That's that's division. Yes. Um, I don't know if that was the. the, the Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, it's okay. Yeah. It's very natural because in your definition of I'm right, if we measure a factor, so you divide. Right. <coughs> yeah. So, so that yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That just means that we're it's R divided by W I, and that's if we're looking at the tail of um, tail of this thing, then we'd be kind of you know W I times X greater than um, R, and so we we wind up dividing. So that, that's that's the intuition for for where this thing comes from, um, and I'll, I'll say more about um, how we we get this result a little bit later. Uh, but I want to um, try and simplify it because I think in this form it doesn't look very friendly or very useful. Um, 
But here is a, an important fact for majorization theory, that any function um, of a, a vector v, again, I'm assuming v is, um, has all non-negative components, any function of v is just, if it's a sum of some other function f of um, uh, each component separately. Um, so if, um, so this function is sure convex if f is convex, and it's sure concave if f is concave. And of course, we know simple conditions for, uh, for con uh, convexity, right? If, if the derivative exists and is non-increasing, it's concave. If the derivative exists and is non-decreasing, it's convex, uh, I'm sorry, concave. And um, uh, an interesting fact is that um, while in general, um, f being uh, convex does not necessarily mean that, uh, I'm sorry, little f. In general, little f being convex does not imply that capital F is uh, sure convex. But if f prime exists and is continuous everywhere, uh, then in fact it's an if and only if relationship. Um, so th this is where we get, if you remember, um, I'm not sure I want to go back all those many slides, but if you remember that function, we had um, f sub alpha of v equals sum of vi to the alpha to the one over alpha. Um, basically, sure convexity and concavity of this uh, for various values of alpha falls exactly from this fact. OK. Um, so from here, we can show that. Um, so now let's, let's assume we have a slightly stronger condition on our Levy measure that in fact it has a uh, continuous density uh, so that we could, uh, with respect to Lebesgue measure. So again, condition, uh, graph in one is technical or? No, no, it's symmetric. It's symmetric. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes uh, 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 exactly. Okay. Um, yes, so let, let's assume that the Levy measure has such a, a density, uh, which is con has basically a density with respect to the Le Lebesgue measure, which is continuous, uh, except at zero. I'm not going to worry about what happens at zero, but uh, continuous everywhere else. Um, so I'm allowing it to blow up at zero and do whatever it likes. Um, and of course, um, stable distributions have this kind of um, uh, le le um, a Levy measure this form. So that, that's one case, in it, but there's um, very many situations where the Levy measure uh, is of this form. And then um, basically we just need to, uh, using this fact, we just need the derivative to be, uh, uh, right, so here we have exactly, right, it's a sum of some kind of functions of the Wi's. Therefore, um, yeah, therefore, since the sum of functions Wi's, it's going to be sure convex if and only, uh, well, uh, let's just say if um, each one of those uh, terms that we're adding um, is uh, convex. And that's true if its derivative is uh, non increasing. And so if we take the derivative of each one of these, uh, these terms here, We'll wind up ex uh, the derivative, of course, in terms of um, the uh, wi's. We'll wind up exactly with this condition that's x squared times m of x should be non-increasing for for the function um, g to be sure convex, and the function should be non-decreasing for that uh, previous function to be sure concave, and Therefore, the result of the theorem simplifies to this, I think, maybe much more intuitive formulation. Okay, um, let me give a discussion of a particular uh, class of um, uh, infinitely divisible distributions that, are, that we get from subordinating a Brownian motion. 
Um, so let's think about, let's let W be a standard Brownian motion so that essentially W1 is just a standard normal distribution. And let YT be a Levy process where Y1 has some infinitely divisible distribution which we'll assume is in P, so it's positive. Uh, so it's always positive. So YT is uh, always positive and in fact it's always going to be increasing. So YT is a positive increasing process. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so now let, let assume that our process Y and W are, are independent of each other. And let's consider this uh, a random variable or a, a new process X sub T, which is just a Brownian motion subordinated to our Levy process. So basically we have now a random time. Um, so one way that uh, we can interpret this kind of a uh, random time is to think of yt as kind of being market time. Um, this idea goes back, I think, to the, to the 1960s with uh, several papers of uh, Mendelbrot, where he, 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 was, he, uh, he was trying to say that there might be something true about the normal distribution, because back then everyone assumed distribu uh, returns or most financial assets were distributed as normal distribution. He was saying there might be some truth to that normality, but we wind up with much heavier tails than that because, uh, because actually we, uh, the time needs to be looked at differently. And we shouldn't look at the normal distribution in terms of the real time, but the market sometimes has uh, periods where time goes, uh, where, um, where there's a lot of, vo a, a huge volume of, uh, of trading. And so in some sense, even though it might just be one day, but actually, in terms of the market, that's, that's many days, whereas another day, very little uh, trading happens, and so uh, maybe that's not even a full day. Um, so that, that's kind of in intuition behind this, and this, this is a very simple model of, of market time, where we're assuming the time is independent of the Brownian motion. There's much more, um, much more complicated models that one can use. Um, but, but anyway, so this, is, um, th this creates a kind of a new process, uh, X sub T, which itself is a Levy process. Um, and if we think of um, uh, yeah, uh, now if we think of um, distributions coming from this uh, Levy process, I'm going to just state things in terms of the Levy process at time one, but actually we could do this at any time for, this, uh, for these Levy processes, but basically, um, uh, of course that's a typo, it should be a space between Levy and measure. Uh, but basically, let's take uh, x1, x2, up to xn to be IID random variables with exactly the distribution of this time change Brownian motion where we take the sort of market time at time one. Then, um, for this distribution, uh, we will have, uh, and again, I'm still making the assumption that the Levy measure, now the Levy measure uh, of the underlying uh, Y process, uh, yeah, Y process, right, it, uh, uh, right there, Y is distribution mu, mu is infinitely divisible with some Levy uh, measure, and let's assume that that Levy measure has density uh, little m of x, uh, continuous again, possibly outside of uh, uh, zero. Um, then, uh, we can get, and I, I don't have a slide for it, but we can get a formula for the Levy measure of the um, of the new pro of the new random variable um, w uh, sub y one uh, in terms of little m, and um, and basically by similar arguments to the previous corollary. In this case, uh, we get that value at risk. Um, always encourages diversification if this slightly different function is non-increasing. And it always discourages diversification if the function is non-decreasing. So uh, basically similar argument as the previous corollary, just now uh, instead of looking at the Levy measure of sort of our, uh, our infinitely divisible distribution, we're looking at the Levy measure of this, uh, of the new Levy measure we get after uh, subordinating the Brownian motion. Okay. Um, 
and I want to say a little bit about trying to remove the assumption that they're IID. Uh, I'll still kind of, um, okay, well, um, okay, let, let me first state this for a very similar, uh, simple and maybe not that interesting uh, model of dependence and then maybe go to one that's uh, a little bit more, uh, more interesting but kind of builds on this simple model. So now l assume that Y1 uh, up to Yn are IID. Um, uh, infinitely divisible distributions, again, from either one of our classes, S or uh, P. Um, and now let Z be some random variable um, which is independent um, of it and always bigger than zero. So consider a new uh, random uh, vector, right, where instead of X, where we consider instead of Y1 through Yn, we multiply every single one of them by Z. So Z somehow, right, I mean, certainly it's going to introduce some dependence, uh, in, into the situation, uh, of course, it's, it's a very simple kind of dependence. They're all kind of just have this one kind of shock uh, applied to them. If you scale the distribution measure by one random parameter, will it work or not? Let's multiply. Uh, uh, and, and, and what kind of process we will have? If we take uh, okay, some reasonable living process multiplied by random parameter, everything, so the whole living measure is integrated. Is it, does it make any sense, this process? I, I, I didn't exactly follow the definition of the process. Okay, to, 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 to take a uh, possible process mm -hmm. and multiply lambda by a random parameter, it will, it will be a Markov chain, mm -hmm. obviously. What, what will happen with this more general in the process, it will just multiply the linear measure by a random parameter and integrate. It doesn't make a, any kind of um, I, I don't know. That's that's an interesting question. Um, maybe we, we can. Okay. okay. At least it's easy to see that for for some process it would be a Markov process and the write down all transition lines it will not be a big deal. But but if you go beside linear process beside for some process to some more general linear process, the question wouldn't make any reasonable sense. If, if, if we take this more general, say, take a Gaussian, multiply everything by a random parameter and integrate, it won't make any sense. Um, well, um, well, if you multiply it by a random, so you mean you just take a, a normal random variable, multiply by some, random, random, uh, by some okay. other random variable? Take a person, for example, okay, if I take just, just, just a number, just possible process, and multiply it by a reasonable random variable. It would be a simple Markov process with some under variable control. Take a bit far, say, take, so say, inverse Gaussian. Multiply a very simple uh, measure by some random parameter, uh, reasonable random parameter with reasonable distribution. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. Maybe we can, uh, we can discuss it um, afterwards. So, there might be something interesting there, and I'd have to think about it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, so, he, so here, here we ju just take um, right, at the distribution. We just take these uh, random var uh, these um, IID random variables y1 through yn, and multiply each one of them by uh, by z, where z is the same, uh, the same, uh, the same, uh, exactly the same random variable. We're assuming this random variable is always uh, positive. Um, and so we can kind of think of it as, as, as giving kind of a shock to every one of these uh, risk components jointly. Um, in this case, it's not uh, difficult to show that uh, basically if, uh, well, if, uh, if, if value at risk, is, you know, if, based, uh, if the value at risk based on portfolio with uh, weights U is less or equal to that with uh, weights V, then the same thing will have to be true for our um, random variables uh, x after they've, they've had this uh, random shock. Um, and similarly for the reverse inequality, so for these kind of distributions, we still wind up with um, value at risk being uh, sure uh, convex if the, core, the, the conditions that we mentioned earlier uh, hold, and sure con um, concave if, uh, if the corresponding conditions hold again. So uh, nothing changes if we add this uh, little bit of uh, additional uh, kind of additional shock, uh, common shock, which um, which introduced a little bit of dependence into this situation. Um, the proof, I, I think, is pretty straightforward. Maybe not, not even worse. Maybe it's clear, and then it's necessary to 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just uh, just just condition, uh, yeah, just just a conditional argument is, is exactly the, the result here. Okay, uh, but perhaps more interesting is if we allow for multiple common shocks. So let z1 through zd be independent, uh, not necessarily identically distributed random variables. Each one of them is always uh, strictly positive. Um, so those are all. Those are going to be our common shocks, and then we have some um, uh, some random variables. Um, uh, so, so then we have some infinitely divisible distributions, and uh, I'm just I, I'm just going to focus on the case where they're symmetric. So we take uh, some infin some d infinitely divisible distributions, and let um, uh, y i j be. Uh, come from distribution mu sub j, and we get n iid copies of y. And we do this for each one of our distributions, and we assume that basically all of these are independent. Uh, then if we consider every single one of our models as being this kind of a linear combination, so we have, um, right, so every xj is a sum, here we have zj, I'm sorry, this is xi, here we have zj, so these are the common shocks, and these are kind of the uh, independent components of how this particular asset will deal with that um, shock. Um, and in this case, we basically get um, a very similar uh, condition uh, that we had before. Um, but now we need, right, because we have many, right, we have D infinitely divisible distributions, we need either uh, we would like either all of them to kind of encourage diversification or all of them to uh, discourage it. But if for every j, this, this function that we've already seen before for just one uh, situation, if for every j uh, this is sure convex, then value at risk will also be sure convex. And if it's always uh, sure concave for every single one of our infinitely divisible distributions, uh, then the value at risk would also be uh, sure concave. Okay, um, now I want to give a particular example. This is a class of models that I've um, worked with quite a bit called tempered stable distributions. Um, those of you who went to my previous talk, that was pretty much all devoted to this class. Uh, on the other hand, those of you who didn't go to the talk, I, I'll, I'll just briefly discuss uh, what these distributions are. Um, so, uh, oh, um, the we can have a break now, or um, okay. So uh, maybe we can uh, come back to um, to what, what we've been discussing. So so we gave some uh, general conditions. Um, this is uh, pretty. This corollary gives pretty, I think, reasonable conditions for when, if we have. Uh, IID of uh, infinitely divisible random variables, which are either symmetric or uh, always positive. Uh, these are the conditions under which value at risk will um, kind of will, will be sure convex in, in, in the first case and sure concave um, in the second case. And basically, everything is determined by whether x squared times the Levy density. Uh, is increasing, uh, non-increasing or non-decreasing. Um, so once we know m of x, we can basically just check if, if, if x squared times m of x is always non-increasing or non-decreasing. So there's a lot of situations that we could just directly apply this to. And one class of models that I want to um, apply this to is the class of tempered stable distributions. Um, and uh, I want to apply it to this class, I, I suppose, for two reasons. One is, is well, maybe just because I, I spent a lot of time studying this class. Um, but the other one is that I think this class does get at certain things that you really want in, um, when, when you're looking at uh, financial, uh, financial data. So the uh, uh, tempered stable distribution is, uh, is an infinitely divisible distribution with no Gaussian part and a Levy measure given in this way. 
So note, um, we have these kind of functions. Um, uh, okay, we have these functions q minus and uh, q plus. If these function, uh, and I'm assuming that the functions are of this form, basically there's some kind of Laplace transforms. But let's say I didn't have these functions. Instead of these functions, I just had some constants. Then this would be exactly uh, the Levy measure of a stable distribution. So if we didn't have these functions q minus and q plus, we would have uh, Levy measures of um, stable distributions. But here, we're kind of uh, modifying the Levy measure of a stable distribution. And instead of putting constants, we put these kind of functions, which um, under appropriate conditions on the measures Q will um, basically make, make sure that you know, these things actually exist and that everything's integrable and nice. Um, the, these functions will go to 0. And since they go to zero, that means that we're making the tails of, um, of this Levy measure lighter. And making the tails of the Levy measure lighter basically corresponds to making the tails of the actual distribution lighter as well. Um, and if we, if these, and under certain conditions, um, we, I, I won't, I don't think I need, need it here, but very often we assume that um, when x approaches zero, th these approach uh, one, and that can, uh, which which is uh, actually not one, but just some constant, which is equivalent to the QIs being finite measures, and that's to guarantee that near zero, this uh, measure will still have the characteristics of uh, the stable distribution. So basically, we're taking this uh, measure and we're leaving it unchanged near zero, but making its tails lighter. And under certain conditions, um, we, uh, th this will actually give us a measure that is very similar to an alpha stable Levy measure for a wide range of x's, uh, but with ultimately light tails. Um, is, it, is it important that alpha is the same on positive and <coughs> negative half line? Um, because there is a kind of cool model. You know, cool model. Um, I, cool. I, I, I don't know that. It's a very, very famous model in finance where this is also this type, but alpha could be different for positive things. Uh, so I, I have seen situations where people take alpha to be different uh, on the two sides, um, but um, I'm not making that a, a assumption. I don't, it will actually, for the result, it will not matter so long as both, uh, both sides, the alpha is either, in both cases, bigger than one. Well, well I, I actually, my result in this case will be basically limited to alphas being bigger than one. So, um, but if they're both bigger than one, then, then it will be per uh, everything I will say will, cor will be fine for that model as well. And what do you assume of the measure Q capital? Okay, um, so, on, uh, so P is just some constant uh, greater than zero. Maybe let, let me write a very simple uh, situation. Let's just assume we have E to the minus X um, uh, to the P, S, maybe some constant, X to the minus one minus alpha. Let, let, let's just make things symmetric for simplicity, uh, DX. Uh, so let's say this is um, uh, I write this yeah Let, let's say this is the, uh, the measure which basically is just a point where the Q is a point mass. Um, so what we could think of right is is we see that what uh, when uh, when S, so s is a parameter right s and C are, are parameters along with P and alpha. Alpha comes from the alpha stable. The other three parameters are kind of part of the tempering or modifying the stable distribution. And what we're doing here is, um, right, we're modifying the tail. So if, let, let's think of S as being something really small, very close to zero. If S is very close to zero, then this thing is very close to one for small and medium sized X's. So the Levy measure for small, medium-sized x's will not um, will, will be very similar to that of the stable distribution, even though for very large x's uh, it will actually have exponential decay. And how fast this function makes things go to zero uh, will, in a sense, depend on p. Right? The larger p is, uh, 
the quicker this thing goes to zero. Um, so, so that's kind of how we could think of the parameter p. p is just some uh, uh, not, not, not equal to zero, greater than p is strictly greater than zero. So p is just some uh, parameter greater than zero, which helps uh, to tell us a little bit about how fast this thing goes to zero. So larger p, this can go to zero faster. Uh, in terms of q, I believe the only assumptions we need to, well, there's two assumptions we need to make. One is that this, uh, I guess it's not, in, uh, if, if p were 1, this is a Laplace transform, but this is kind of a slightly transformed Laplace transform. Um, we need it to exist, and we need this thing to be a Levy measure. Um, do I have a, uh, I don't have a, a slide, but basically we need to make sure, right, that um, integral, um, from, uh, let's just say integral over R of um, x squared min 1 um, of our measure, m of dx is finite, right, for it to be a valid Levy measure. So we need the q's to, uh, the q measures to be such that this thing will be, will still be finite. Uh, uh, there is a case of different, uh, can be reduced to the case of uh, equal, uh, Modifying the uh, Q? Uh, yes, uh, um, yes, you can. Um, you would wind up increase. You, you can increase alpha. You can't decrease alpha, but you can increase alpha by choosing the appropriate uh, Q. And actually, in my talk yesterday, I talked a little bit uh, about how we can do that um, uh, for appropriately chosen uh, Q functions. Am I right that uh, so we can see the case on each system with zero, then of course alpha plays a measure. So alpha is responsible for small jumps, mm -hmm. let me say, and P is for large jumps. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Um, P well, it, 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 yes. P for large jumps, but of course this whole function. So P and S will will be responsible for mm -hmm. uh, small jumps. Okay. So of course for this distribution to be symmetric. We need uh, q, uh, q minus to be equal to q plus uh, almost everywhere. For it to belong to, um, uh, there's a typo here, but for it to belong to class P, uh, we need, uh, if we multiply the measure by x, it should be integral between 0 and 1. So there actually, there should not be a minus 1 here, it should just be x to the uh, minus alpha. Uh, and that will guarantee. Um, well, of course, q, q0 should be always 0 because for it to be positive, we can't have uh, the Levy measure have any mass on the negative side. Uh, but, uh, but even for the positive side, we need to make sure we have finite variation. And finite variation would be exactly this condition, again, up to, we need to get rid of this minus 1 here. So, um, so, so that's uh, when it can be in P. And uh, note that since Q plus is non-increasing, um, this can only hold for alpha between 0 and 1. It can't be, uh, we cannot have this condition hold for alpha greater than or equal to 1. Um, it, that's just, it will just have to diverge. OK, so, um, so now for this class of models, um, if we take alpha between 1 and 2, then the function x squared times uh, q plus times x to the minus 1 minus alpha. I'll simplify it a little bit. And it's, uh, since the q is not increasing, um, x to right, alpha is bigger than or equal to 1. So x to the 1 minus alpha is not uh, increasing. So the whole thing is not increasing. Um, so thus, uh, by... Um, by our theorem, or I guess the corollary to the theorem, in this case, um, uh, when gamma is between 0.5 and 1, uh, value at risk uh, is going to be sure, um, uh, sure convex. So satisfy uh, the theorem. So maybe just uh, this illustration is just to show that uh, the, the previous results weren't just kind of, not, it's nice to be able to get some results that say something, but actually for a very large class of models, we can very easily uh, say something. Um, 
right? So for any uh, tempered stable distribution, doesn't matter the value of P, doesn't matter what the Qs are. Well, okay, I should be careful. Of course, not every, we're focusing only on symmetric and positive. Uh, but, but in that, uh, and, um, oh, and of course for positive here, it doesn't make sense because we're focusing on alpha uh, bigger than one, which, so the positive ones uh, aren't included here. Uh, but, but for all symmetric tempered stable distributions um, with alpha greater than or equal to one, we, we get this, uh, this result uh, very naturally from the corollary. Now, in general, there's nothing that we can say about the case when alpha is between uh, 1 and 2. Uh, in this case, value at risk can be sure convex or sure concave or neither. So, for instance, to see how it could be neither, uh, let's take the, uh, the uh, symmetric case where our function is just e to the minus x to the power p. Basically, just this thing, I'm forgetting about c, forgetting about s, just setting both of them to 1. This is just uh, the function that I'm using. Um, and for this function, it's easy to see that x squared times m of x is neither non-increasing nor non-decreasing. Now, of course, our theorem uh, that we've been discussing is, um, uh, is not if and only if, right? It's only in one direction. But remember, we had that third part, which said that under the condition of finite uh, variation, in fact, it is if and only if. And so, because in this case, we do have uh, uh, finite variation, right? Again, we're focusing on alpha between 0 and 1. We have this uh, function which is uh, going to, uh, everything's going to be well behaved near 0. Um, uh, in this case, we do have finite variation, and so, by the, by, uh, by the main theorem that we had, um, this, if, it, uh, this, uh, if it's non-decreasing uh, non is equivalent to sure uh, co convexity, and non-increasing is equivalent to sure concavity. And since it's neither, it can't be either one. So this is a situation where we get neither, uh, neither, neither one of those results. So the case alpha between 0 and 1, really there's nothing we could say in general. Um, there are certain particular classes we could try to characterize, um, but, uh, but nothing can be done in general for that case. Of course, for alpha stable distributions, we, we were able to say everything about that case, right? It kind of is the reverse of the um, alpha greater than 1 case. But here, uh, we really can't say something. It's not just a limitation of the method of proof, but really anything can happen. A simple example, when this function is non-decreasing or increasing, is it, is it easy to, to get an example? It's a counterexample uh, somehow, and but where is the example? Uh, oh, when, when it actually is. Um, so one, one thing that's true about tempered stable distributions um, is that we can always um, decrease uh, alpha. So if we choose, so for any tempered stable distribution with alpha greater than one, we can choose an appropriate uh, functions uh, Q, Q uh, uh, or measure Q for which actually it will be an alpha stable distribution, uh, I'm sorry, uh, tempered stable distribution with alpha less than one. So we can always find an appropriate Q to decrease alpha. Um, so, so in that sense, um, uh, yeah, so 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 that, so that would give us an example um, uh, where where it is um, going to have the same nice properties as uh, as when alpha is greater than or equal to one. Um, I don't uh, uh, remember. Oh, of course, um, alpha stable distributions are also tempered stable with alpha less than one, and so those we already know they have the reverse inequality. So here we have examples of all three situations that can happen. Um, yeah, so, as I said, a a anything can happen. It could always be sure convex, always sure concave, or neither. Okay, and, um, and uh, again, we could consider this case of subordinated Brownian motion. So let WT be standard Brownian motion. Um, and now let's consider, so, 
x to be positive, uh, tempered stable distribution. Remember now, in this case, alpha has to be between 0 and 1. So we talked about alphas between 0 and 1 uh, because they do still come up here if we want to uh, consider the case where uh, we're looking at subordinate Brownian motion. So to talk about positive ones, they have to be uh, with alpha between 0 and 1. We already discussed that because we need finite. That's the only uh, situation where we can get finite uh, variation. Okay, and now, um, again, if x is uh, this kind of tempered stable, that's in p. Um, if we subordinate a uh, uh, Brownian motion, or in this case, just stop, uh, kind of randomly stop it at a time, which is x, this distribution w sub x, w at time x, is called a, nor a normal tempered stable distribution. Um, and these have been, at least in certain situations, they've been studied somewhat in the context of value at risk. There's a couple of papers by uh, Kim et al. Um, I think Kim, I think Bianchi, Rachev, uh, I forget the rest of the authors, which studied some numerical methods for implementing or actually evaluating value at risk for tempered stable and normal tempered stable distributions, at least of certain types. Um, so that's been uh, studied. And now for this normal tempered stable distribution, uh, basically if alpha is between 0.5 and 1, uh, then we get that value at risk is going to be um, uh, sure convex again. Um, so we, we get the same uh, same results as uh, as before for the um, uh, for the regular case. But so here, uh, notes in the same way that before we needed alpha to be bigger than one. Here we need alpha bigger than 0. 0.5. Although uh, the case when alpha equals 0. 0.5 is included. And I emphasize the case when alpha is included because that it, one important uh, distribution, which is tempered, st uh, tempered stable, uh, positive tempered stable with uh, alpha equal to 1 half, is the inverse Gaussian. And that one is very commonly used for in these kind of situations. So for the inverse Gaussian, it holds, but that's kind of on the boundary. If you had uh, alpha any smaller, it would not hold. Okay, um, yeah, and the proof basically again, uh, we wind up with, uh, we, we need, uh, so here's our uh, density for, our Lebesgue density for the tempered stable distribution. And remember, we had a slightly different function that needed to be non-increasing, which is x cubed times m squared, which turns out to be this, and exactly, so this of course is, uh, is non-increasing, q by definition is not increasing. So to get this, uh, this part non-increasing, we need exactly alpha greater than or equal to 1 half. So that's, uh, that's where the kind of restriction of alpha being greater than or equal to 1 half comes from. OK. Um, so so that, that's the main things I wanted to talk about. Now I want to say just a few words about uh, where, how, how we can prove this theorem. So this, again, this is the main theorem that we uh, wrote down uh, earlier. Um, so we have this uh, uh, function g sub r and sure convexity of value at risk is determined by whether g r is uh, sure convex or and the uh, value at risk is sure concave if g r is sure concave. To choose these conditions of course it's sufficient. In, in this form yes but once we transform it in terms of density I think checking it is uh, quite simple. So that's why I uh, I, I give this general form because here we can say a lot more, but in the case where, uh, or because this is kind of the general situation, but in the case when we have a continuous density, I think the, the conditions of just non-increasing or non-decreasing are quite easy to check as we just... I mean, the context, true context. Uh, yeah, so sure, that's exactly right. Um, we have these conditions of, um, right, we want, so in this case, x squared times m of x is non-increasing uh, or non-decreasing. That's equivalent to GR being uh, sure convex or concave. Maybe it's, it's uh, justify somehow attempts to, to, to estimate the Levy density because <laughs> it's not stable, of course, with respect to decreasing, but nevertheless. Um, uh, sure. We do not know density, of course, also. Um, of, of course, when we talk about when we don't know, when we look at data, of course, we, we don't know what the distribution is. So certainly, in that case, we're not going to know, um, uh, you know, um, what, what, what's going on. 
Um, of course, uh, yes, there's, there's some non-parametric methods of estimating the OD measure and the density. Uh, here I'm thinking more if we know that it's within a particular parametric class and maybe we could estimate it using uh, maximum likelihood or something of that nature. Um, so w within a particular parametric class, we, we, can, we can check this, but we would need to know, of course, whether the actual data comes from this parametric class or not. Okay. Right, so um, so this is, this is again, this is a theorem, and I'll just um, say something about the first part and kind of where the proof comes from. Remember, value at risk is basically a statement about the quantile, and saying something about the quantile is, is not too different from saying something about the tail of the distribution. Uh, maybe, maybe it's good for me to, uh, uh, to, uh, to remind us um, value at risk, sub gamma of some loss. Let me in this case use our notation of double, uh, x sub w, so our portfolio. This is the infimum over all L such that P of x w greater than um, L is less than or equal to 1 minus uh, gamma. Um, so basically, uh, a statement about value at risk is, uh, has a corresponding statement about the tail of the distribution. So what we want to do is find some relation between the tail of the distribution and, um, and the tail of the Levy measure. Right? Because this, this uh, function gr is just the tail of the Levy measure of, of the portfolio xw. So if we want to say something about the tail of the Levy measure, uh, or we, so we want to relate the tail of the distribution to the tail of the Levy measure, and, um, and this is a, well, I call it a lemma because the lemma for, for my theorem, but actually this is a, a pretty interesting theorem which uh, I'm giving just a very special case of it here in this lemma, but actually in the um, original paper. So this is a paper by Samaraniski and Taku from 1994. It's uh, it's not in the book that they also released in 1994, but a paper from that year. Um, and they basically uh, were looking at um, stochastic orderings of infinitely divisible uh, random variables. And, um, and they s uh, showed that if, uh, mu x and mu, uh, if x and y are infinitely divisible distributions in P, so specifically the uh, positive uh, case, uh, the, and their Levy measures are mx and my respectively, then we have an ordering of their, the tails of their Levy measures. So uh, for any r, kind of the tail, or kind of think of this as being greater than or equal to r, for x and for y, so we have this inequality, if and only if the corresponding inequality holds for, their, um, for the tails of their actual distributions. Um, they had a somewhat more general result, not just in p and in more dimensions, but, but for our purposes, uh, this is the result that we need, and it very, very nicely relates the, uh, the, the tail of the distribution, which exactly is, is related to the uh, value at risk, uh, to the Levy measure. And basically, we can almost immediately from here uh, get the, the result in the case where the distribution is in P. Now, in the case where the distribution is not in P but in S, we need to do a little bit more uh, work. So first, I'm going to consider the case of finite variation, so that uh, integral at the top is finite. Um, now for um, any vector, uh, weight vector w, we can then um, write xw, now, uh, or I guess I should say xw is still going to have a Levy measure with a finite, uh, or it will still satisfy finite variation. So the Levy measure of xw will also satisfy uh, that, uh, the finiteness of that kind of an integral. And that means that we can write xw as the difference of two, um, um, two positive uh, kind of random variables, um, one whose uh, Levy measure is just the Levy measure of the portfolio on the positive side, and the other one, well, because the minus sign, uh, I'm assuming that they're uh, IID with this Levy measure, but basically because the minus sign, one kind of says, okay, we have this on the positive side, the other one says we have this on the minus side. Um, 
And by, uh, because xw is symmetric, this will exactly equal the distribution to xw. Uh, now, um, now, the nice thing is it allows us to talk about the absolute value of xw because the absolute value of xw is exactly the sum of these two. And this is really where we need the finite variation. We need the, so the finite variation guarantees that x1 and x2 are positive. And since they're positive, uh, that means that exactly their sum is going to be the absolute value. If they were negative, then, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if it didn't satisfy that um, integrability condition, then they could potentially, is there a question? just Factor two will also. Oh, this factor. Ah. I was thinking about our own decisions. Ah, okay. Um, okay. So um, yeah. So absolute. So because of the finite variation, we can write the absolute value of x w as the sum of these two. Otherwise, these two could have some probability of being negative. But so this way, they're both positive, and the negativity of x w comes exactly because x w two can be, uh, well, is, neg uh, is negative because of the minus sign. So the minus sign introduces all the negative uh, things into this. So if you remove that, this has to be positive and will be the absolute value of xw. And its Levy measure is going to be exactly two times this, uh, this Levy measure of the portfolio restricted to be positive. Uh, that's because they're independent. We add their Levy measure, so that's why, where we get the two from. Um, and now, uh, if R is positive, then, um, well, this term equals this term here, just by, by this condition up here. And by symmetry, this is exactly two times the probability XW is greater than R. Right, with R greater than zero. Okay, so, uh, so basically for we, we can relate value at risk to, uh, um, to the um, tails of the distributions. And the reason I'm saying by symmetry is, uh, by symmetry, uh, that's in the, why we need gamma between 0.5 and uh, 1. So in that case, we get, that, um, we get this if and only if relationship between value at risk uh, for gamma between 0.5 and 1. And the tails here for R positive. Right? If it wasn't symmetric, uh, then we wouldn't be able to, gamma would need to play with, and it wouldn't be exactly R positive. But this way, uh, we get this relationship. With, so, so basically, the symmetry uh, is what allows us to correspond gamma between 0.5 and 1 to R positive. Um, otherwise, the result would still be true. Okay. And as we just saw in the previous slide, we can, uh, we can um, rewrite each one as, well, right? Um, Two times this equals this one. Well, we can multiply um, both sides here by two and use that formula to, uh, to get this statement. And now by the lemma, since now um, we're just looking at distributions in, um, that are positive, uh, the lemma tells us that this is exactly equivalent to um, this inequality with the Levy measures. And writing out these Levy measures basically gives us our functions gr. Right? This corresponds to gr of u, gr of v. Uh, of course, I've canceled out the twos. Um, and this is true for all u um, majorized by v if and only if gr is uh, sure convex for all r greater than 0. So we have this kind of long sequence of if and only if statements, but uh, basically they tell us exactly that value at risk um, is uh, sure convex if and only if uh, gr is sure convex. Um, okay, now, uh, and of course this is if and only if. So remember, we're in a finite variation case. Um, we're in the finite variation case, which is the case where we do have if and only if conditions. Now let's uh, remove the assumption of finite variation. Um, then what we can do is we can approximate, 
uh, by distributions that are finite variation. So the only the problem with infinite variation is the behavior of the Levy measure near zero. So we need to kind of, if we balance the Levy measure away and say, okay, let's just forget about what happens near zero. So we consider the Levy measure where we're just saying, okay, x is always bigger than one over m. And then by arguments very similar to the previous case, we're essentially in the finite variation case. And so we can get a very similar result to what we had before. And then it's basically just a matter of taking limits uh, as m goes to um, infinity. And that will give us the result. So uh, that's this part of the talk, which it ran a little bit longer than I um, expected. But we still have, I guess, about 30 minutes. So I can talk, uh, start the next part of the talk, which is kind of an un unrelated topic, uh, mostly unrelated topic, but one that I yeah, thought that this would take me a little bit less time. Um, and maybe I'll finish that topic um, next week at my um, lecture on Thursday. How do I maximize it? Control L. Uh, ah, okay. So okay. Okay, so um, the, the, the title of this talk is maybe, um, well, it's kind of long and maybe not exactly about everything that this talk is about, uh, but I, at least part of what I want to do with this uh, talk is to try to explain how temperate stable distributions appear in applications. Now, in my first talk, I discussed um, a little bit about why distributions with, um, uh, that look like a stable distribution but with lighter tails come up in applications. Um, but there's no reason they should actually be specifically temperate stable. And I'd like to give, uh, using some limit theorems, a little bit of motivation for specifically temperate stable uh, distributions. Um, but, I, but I also want to discuss uh, a number of um, other kinds of limit theorems um, and also some applications um, uh, that kind of uh, motivate some of this discussion. So the first part, this is the part related to temperate stable distributions where we have Right, we're interested in things that look like heavy tails, right? Stable distributions have very heavy tails. Temperate stable, modify them to be lighter. So in some sense, these are heavy tail-like distributions, but with lighter tails. Um, and this, uh, this first part has some applications to uh, ecology, um, sociology, and computer science. But the, the application is actually basically one kind of model, but the model itself has some ramifications for all three of these um, situations. And specifically, this is the situation of modeling how a person or, or an animal uh, walks. And um, um, so this is important in computer science because um, there's a lot of various protocols that, you know, look at, uh, I mean, everyone has a cell phone and they need to be able to interact with the cell phone. So they need to have some idea of how, you know, if I'm here right now, how likely I am to, you know, go that way or, or this way or, you know, uh, so they need to have some way of dealing with that as I'm moving. They need to allow, uh, you know, for various protocols that deal with the fact that I'm actually moving. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of protocols that have been developed. Uh, and the difficulty is, uh, you know, uh, seeing how good these protocols actually do, right? Is this a, is this a good protocol or, or, or not? And very often, they're very complicated protocols that you can't theoretically analyze and say what, uh, how good or bad it is. So the main way that people um, test protocols is by running simulations. So they assume that they have some, they simulate some nodes and they uh, try to simulate how these nodes are moving in some space and run their protocol on these nodes as if these were people. Um, and so I, I have to say the literature is, uh, uh, these kind of protocol, uh, not protocols, but the mo mo mobility models for human motion are very unrealistic, uh, uh, very many of them. Uh, is there a question? I, I had a lot of discussions with some biologists who um, working on experiments with satellite tracking of um, sea, 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 sea turtle. So they catch the turtle, put uh, transmitter, and then track the movement of the satellite. And what they're saying is that it looks, it's not that look like three 
Le Levi flies. Because they tend to move, uh, it looks like uh, Levi flies in potential field. Because, the, 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 because they tend to be trapped in some area where you have a lot of full stuff. So, so somehow they travel like uh, Levi flies between such islands that they are trapped mm -hmm. for a very long time. So it looks like a living flight between potential wells, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll talk more about uh, levee flights and some uh, slightly different modifications, but, but that's interesting. There might be some, uh, some nice additional models that you can do when you have these kind of things that certain animals keep re uh, returning to. Um, but, but here I'll more talk about more standard, I guess, uh, levee flights. Um, but I just, uh, yeah, I just want to kind of end this, this uh, kind of introduction for why this is interesting in computer science. Uh, just by saying that we do need realistic ways of modeling how humans move, even if they're not perfect. And a lot of models that have been used really don't look at the data of human motion at all. Uh, there's, I'm only aware of one paper uh, that, that came out a couple of years ago that looks at data. Before that, uh, and even after that, most papers just say, well, let's just assume it, it follows uh, uh, one of the most common models, random waypoint, just we have some bounded simulation area, and we just say we randomly choose a location and just walk there, and then randomly choose another location and walk there, which is not very realistic. So uh, we want to be able to get something a little bit more uh, realistic in, in how to model this. Yes? Can you tell us in Vector 1, so does it will play some roles that we are included by walking two dimensional? Um, I, I, I'm not sure it's... Uh, it matters uh, that much because I'll actually be more focused on, uh, in, in, well, uh, for some part things it will uh, matter a little bit toward the end, but mainly I'll mostly talk actually about kind of one dimensional motion when we kind of pick a direction and move in that specific direction. Um, so, um, so I, I'm not, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of what I'll be modeling. Later on I'll talk a little bit about a situation where the R2 does play a role. But I'm asking you because uh, I heard one that there was an essential difference between round motion two dimensional cases and three dimensional cases. It's exactly about walking. So, okay, I can tell you later. Yeah, I'd be happy to discuss it uh, more. I think this, the, 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 the flavor of what I'll be discussing, uh, that, doesn't, that will not be a, kind of play a role. But although I'm talking about this in R2, actually, in, in many ways, uh, my discussion will be more actually R1. Um, okay. So with that uh, kind of introduction to, to this situation, let's actually uh, think about how um, a person or to an extent an animal, again, there's definitely additional things that, you know, this isn't completely the most realistic situation, but uh, some idea about how uh, a walker uh, moves. And I say walker, uh, to an extent, I suppose we could think of this as even somebody on a bicycle or something else, but just the walker to, to make things simple. So the walker's location at time t uh, we assume it's described by some stochastic process, uh, yt on R2. And let's assume we observe this process at some discreetly sampled uh, points uh, of, of equal length uh, delta. So we really observe the process xn, where xn is y uh, observed at n delta. OK, let zn be the increment that's, uh, uh, that, uh, that's moved by, by the walker in a time period of length delta. And, and uh, well, of course, its absolute value is, or well, its norm is the magnitude of the displacement. And zi over norm of zi is the direction of travel. Uh, now, uh, one of the most common models is the Levy walk, uh, where we assume that the uh, absolute value of zi's, or the, the, the norms of zi's, are iid random variables from a Pareto distribution. Which, uh, which is uh, just x, basically x to the minus 1 uh, minus alpha. Uh, for this to be well defined, we need x to be greater than uh, delta. Um, alpha, of course, doesn't really have to be between 0 and 1, although um, most studies uh, of this suggest that alpha is between 0 and 1. Um, at least, I don't know about most, but, the, but uh, quite a few of the more recent ones that I uh, saw. Now, of course, this is not a very realistic model. First of all, it says we're always moving uh, more than a little delta, which 
doesn't necessarily have to be true. This doesn't, uh, right, this doesn't necessarily really capture what a person uh, or animal is doing in a, s a small time frame. So maybe more realistically, we should say that the density somehow uh, has these kind of tails. It decays like x to the minus alpha minus 1. Uh, but what it does in the center um, could be quite different. Okay, so now let's let's think about what happens when uh, when the walker stop starts walking, um, right? Um, very often uh, they'll be moving in roughly a, a, a uh, one direction, uh, with some maybe deviations, but roughly in a particular direction. Uh, and so for a very long period of time they'll be walking um, kind of in the same direction. So x n their location at time n, which is maybe the first time they. Devi have a strong deviation from this direction, well, that's the sum of these smaller components up to time n. And, well, uh, of course, in general, we cannot do this uh, here, right? I think the uh, sum outside of the absolute value. But since they're all in the same direction, uh, because of that, then, of course, this is OK. Um, so we can think of, OK, very often the person you know, in, del in these uh, increments of length delta roughly going in the same direction. So we don't necessarily need to model exactly what the person is doing in this small uh, time interval. Much more interesting is uh, what they're doing up to when they really make a major change from the direction they're going in. So we're trying, so basically we're looking at the distribution of this sum. Now of course if n is quite large, we can approximate it by its asymptotic distribution and by the generalized central limit theorem. We know that um, as n approaches infinity uh, under, of course, appropriate normalization, uh, because we have these uh, heavy tails in a very um, simple way, right? Um, asymptotically, just uh, x to the minus 1 minus alpha. Um, uh, is there a question? Two dimensional case? Why you realize that it's in sum of modulus of the sum equals sum of modulus of the If it's in the same direction, uh, of course, in general, that's not true, but if it's in the same direction. Um, it's the same direction. Uh, so these, uh, right, so these are all um, vectors yeah. with the same. Um, uh, He's modeling, if I understand well, you are modeling actually the, the, the length of the uh, of the, the the walks that the uh, guy does mm -hmm. before before two times he changes it. The, the, the direction, right? Yes. Uh, so what, what's going on here, right, we have... Um, you mean the, the vector of Kalinka? The, the, exactly. I, I'm only considering the situation where these are all... Uh, oh, okay, but, but, but yeah, so I, I, to I, have I, some I, diffusion of the sphere, yeah. you have a, a diffusion of the sphere, so you, you slightly change the direction, then you have a jump of the sphere. Then you continue in a completely different direction, with, with some, you get some little diffusion along this angle, then again jump, so there will be much more uh, realistic kind of Yes, I, I agree. This, this okay. is the oversimplification. It's, it's written here. That's the first time that she stops it. Change yeah, um, I, I agree. This is an oversimplification. Um, in, in some ways, um, you, know, uh, you know, something more realistic would certainly be very very nice, but kind of as a, as a first approach to try to, because we don't want to really uh, have to specify um, the distribution uh, exactly. We just want to kind of be able to say about its tails, because it's very difficult to get uh, a, a detailed enough information to say what happens at very small time intervals. Um, this way, we're kind of uh, uh, just saying, let's look at what happens at long. Um, um, at, at long time periods. Да, вот это вот все в одно направление, поэтому, а это вот интересно, во время capital N, это вот время, that's the time when... Um, and it's random. And, and uh, uh, um, yes, and in, in principle is, is random. 
I, 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 I'm not sure. Um, uh, you, do not, you do not want to, to, to join these steps in, in one direction, just to consider random time moving in one straight line, and then you change the direction and moving until the next change. That's exactly what I want to consider. Uh, but I just want to emphasize that we could think of it as being the sum of many smaller components. Um, and, and therefore, we could approximate the distribution by its asymptotic distribution of the sum. Uh, th that's the motivation. So, but by, I, I ultimately, yes, what I want to model is how or the distribution at which a person or, or whomever is walking is going in, in, a, in roughly, and, and I agree, it's not exactly the right, uh, straight direction, but roughly uh, in, in the straight, uh, in the room, just going kind of straight. That's what I want to model. Uh, but um, I want to argue that we can think of that as being a sum of kind of these smaller components. And therefore, if n is quite large, we can think of this in terms of the asymptotic distribution. Um, and then, in terms of the asymptotic distribution, uh, of course, by the, uh, by the generalized central limit theorem, we know that under appropriate scaling, this will converge um, to a stable distribution. Um, which gives some idea that perhaps if you want to model long, uh, uh, how a person just walks in this roughly straight line, we could say, well, the person, uh, we, we could model the length uh, as a uh, stable distribution. Yes, from the beginning, to take a stable distribution. But you, you, you want to justify something. Uh, I want, yes, I want to give some justification for why we use the stable. So I, I don't want to, uh, to just say stable because uh, I, I want to use a stable, I want to give some interpretation of why we would use a stable. Um, because it's a kind of um, a summation of these smaller steps. So um, this way we can look at um, um, the asymptotic distribution, right, and say, well, it can be well modeled by, it should be possible to model it well by a stable distribution. Um, however, the tails of stable distributions, as I've uh, kind of mentioned uh, already several times, uh, are very heavy. And if you think of it in practice, um, uh, people generally don't move uh, kind of too much in one direction. Um, there's various obstacles, you know, there might be a house or a mountain or some or a tree or, or something that, need, that you need to go around. So uh, in some sense, these very heavy tails might not seem so realistic because there's various real world obstacles uh, and of course person can become tired and, and uh, things of this sort that mean that really even if the person kind of starts off really you know uh, fast and going in a particular direction they, they might not go as far as, as you know you might think uh, at the beginning and in fact the empirical data um, suggests that the heavy tails hold for large but not too large uh, values uh, of x. And so perhaps um, a more uh, realistic model is this kind of a um, uh, uh, exponentially tempered uh, situation where instead of the, um, the tails of the density um, being just x, uh, some constant times x to the minus 1 minus alpha, there's this additional exponential term. Um, which it, uh, now, if L is very large, of course, this um, the exponential term will be very close to one for small and medium-sized x's. But when x is gets large enough, ultimately the distribution decays uh, exponentially fast. So now, of course, this distribution is in the domain of attraction of the normal, uh, and. Uh, and not the stable distribution, um, but maybe the, uh, but in, in some, it has what I called in my first lecture, a tempered heavy tail distribution, and that it's, in some ways, there still seems to be some, some truth in the heavy tails up to a point, and uh, 
Uh, as we saw in, um, in some simulations that I presented in, uh, in my first talk, with these kind of distributions, the central limit theorem often takes a really, really long time to hold. So perhaps approximating this with a normal distribution might, might not be quite the best thing to do. Um, so uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to think about, well, what else can we look at that might give us uh, some kind of a limiting argument for another distribution, and, and that other distribution will be a, a tempered stable distribution. Um, right, so in lecture two and a little bit today, we talked about tempered stable distributions, which have this kind of uh, behavior that they, uh, on the one hand, they look uh, heavy tailed in the center and like a stable distribution. So saying maybe there's still some truth to this stable distribution y, even though ultimately we wind up with lighter tails. Um, so uh, now I guess that was kind of the motivation. And um, I'm sure I still have, still have some time. OK. Uh, so that was kind of the motivation. Now let's discuss uh, this kind of model in more generality. So. Um, so again, we're going to start with heavy tails, and then we'll modify the tails to make them uh, ultimately decay exponentially fast. So let mu be a probability measure on the, on the real line in the domain of attraction of an infinite variance stable distribution. Right? This is our original function f before we, we modified it. Um, and uh, for simplicity, uh, we'll assume that uh, mu places no mass on the negative uh, axis. Now, this means that uh, the tails of mu have to be regularly varying with index alpha, where L of x is, um, my markers, where L of x is a slowly varying function, which um, just means that it doesn't, uh, doesn't change very much. So we could think of it as being asymptotically a constant or something like a logarithm, which might go to infinity or zero, but much slower than any uh, power function. Um, more formally, this means that the limit as t goes to infinity of L of tx divided by L of t equals 1 for every x greater than 0. So that's the formal definition, but intuitively we can just think uh, that L is just some um, some function that doesn't change too fast. And uh, I think thinking of it as either as not a constant or a logarithm is maybe uh, the best way uh, for anyone who's not uh, familiar with slowly varying functions. Um, so we define um, V of t. So I I think the question is is this equivalent to the domain of attraction of being in an alpha stable distribution? And that's uh, that's a standard result. It goes back uh, I guess in a slightly different form to the book of uh Kolmogorov and uh Vindenko. And um, uh, uh, in a slightly different form. In this form, uh, Feller, volume two, uh, does a very good job with it. Um, yes. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, so, okay. Uh, for, let me just define this function V of t as t, uh, kind of one over the tail of mu, and V inverse as the generalized inverse of the function uh, V. Um, in this case, um, if we take a n to be 1 over the generalized uh, inverse of v, um, and if we take x1, x2 to be ii, uh, and so forth, to be iid random variables from distribution mu, we can find a sequence of uh, shifts such that um, uh, this uh, uh, shifts eta n such that this will converge as n goes to infinity to some uh, alpha stable distribution R sub alpha. Specifically, um, uh, since we're on the positive, right, we, we made the simplifying assumption that we're on the positive axis. Uh, 
this stable distribution will also be just uh, uh, positive, uh, on, uh, we fully right skewed, and specifically its Levy measure is given this way. Um, and uh, we can show that a n is basically n to the minus 1 over alpha times some uh, slightly different slowly varying function uh, of n. Okay, so now let's modify the tails of this distribution to make them lighter uh, it, by doing this same kind of uh, exponential uh, uh, tempering. So we, we introduce a new um, probability measure, mu sub p, uh, and also a function of L, which is given um, in this form. So exactly what we did before, we basically, of course, we're not assuming that a Lebesgue density exists, but basically the, we multiply mu of dx by this exponential function. Uh, we need to, of course, make sure things still integrate to 1. So we multiply by some um, normalizing constant c sub L. Of course, the C sub L also depends on P, but um, I, I didn't emphasize that dependence. I only emphasize the dependence on L. Um, now this, of course, once we've done the modify the tails, uh, this belongs to the domain of attraction of the Gaussian. Um, but one thing we can look at is what happens if we simultaneously mod uh, change not just how many terms we aggregate, but also look at L and see how, uh, and allow L to go to infinity. So kind of as we go along, we are making, uh, right, remember when L go, if L goes to infinity, that kind of makes the exponential tempering go away. So if you look at what happens when L goes uh, to infinity at the same, uh, as a function of n, as we're aggregating, we're kind of seeing what happens as uh, we have smaller and smaller uh, exponential modification. Um, and we'll, we'll look at some limit theorems uh, in this situation where both n, the number of terms we're adding together, and L go to infinity. And in, in a sense, that will give us some idea of approximating distributions for the case where L is just very large, which is what we assume is true in these kind of uh, applications like the one I mentioned earlier. Shouldn't this be flat? There is the accomplishment here, is it? No. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, so the reason I talk about Lely flights comes from that application to computer science, where uh, where some people talk about Lely flights. Yes. Um, but but in, in this case, um, I think that's it, it just to motivate this uh, this discussion. Uh, okay. Um, uh, so let, let me let me uh, say uh, quickly go through a couple things. Um, there's there's a kind of second part to this talk uh, to this part. I, I really thought my first part would, would go uh, faster than it did, um, which which I think I'll, I'll I, I will I would like to talk about it uh, next next time. Uh, but here uh, maybe let me just then skip over to the main results. So. Um, yeah, so if we consider the situation where L is, where we're aggregating them and L is uh, going to infinity, uh, so now we have LN being a sequence uh, of positive numbers going to infinity, and we consider IID random variables from this temporary distribution, uh, and we consider this summation here. So we add these IID random variables, which depend on LN, so we add N of them, so this is basically the sum of some triangular uh, array. And from theory of summation of triangular arrays, we know that this will converge. It uh, well, doesn't have to converge. But if it converges to something on an appropriate uh, shift, I guess it's not infin uh, infinitesimal yet. But if we modify if we uh, scale it appropriately, it will be infinitesimal. And uh, we could potentially make it converge to some infinitely divisible distribution. Um, and in particular, if uh, a n uh, raised to the power of p times l n goes to zero, uh, we can find the constants uh, for uh, shifting and scaling for which uh, it will converge to a normal distribution, meaning that um, 
the, the modification, the, the light fails kind of win in this situation. This is the case where ln uh, doesn't go to infinity too fast, right? Because still, even though ln is going to infinity, an to the p is going to zero, and this thing is going, uh, an to the p times ln still goes to zero, so kind of the summation uh, wins over, um, o over the ln going to zero, so we still basically still have the light tails as kind of the main, um, the main thing that's governing things, and we wind up converging to a normal distribution. Although, of course, in the usual case, we would need n to the minus 1 uh, minus alpha, but here we need um, a more complicated uh, scaling term, one which goes to 0 uh, faster. Um, and uh, the, the main point here is uh, if a n p l n goes to a constant that's not 0, we'll get convergence, so if that constant c is infinite, we still get convergence to the stable distribution, but if it's not infinite, we get convergence to exactly um, this tempered stable distribution. Um, I want to say more about this, but maybe let me just uh, end by saying that roughly speaking, this condition, that this goes to a constant, basically is a condition of uh, the trade-off between n inverse and ln to the alpha over p, and we could think of, now if ln is not really changing, but some large value l, then if n is much smaller than l to the alpha over p, the distribution is close to an alpha stable, whereas uh, once n gets much bigger than l to the alpha p over p, it's uh, very close to a Gaussian, but in the middle, when n is kind of on the order of l to the alpha over p, it's exactly well approximated by a temper the tempered stable distribution, which gives some idea that the tempered stable distribution might be a reasonable model in this case. And just one more slide I want to show, which is um, how it actually does in fitting uh, uh, distances moved by humans. Um, so this is the... So it, it seems to capture a lot of the main trends here. I'm not going to claim that this is uh, perfect, uh, but at least as a general approximation to how people move, I think this is maybe uh, reasonable and certainly better than um, pretty much everything I've seen in the computer science literature on this topic. So I, I have to end now, um, but maybe I'll talk a little more about this um, next week. So thank you. Thank you.